But before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantum computers and why people care so much about them. There are literally tens of thousands of some of the brightest people in the world today trying to build these machines and understand them. And I'm going to tell you why. In my last 15 years of working on this type of stuff, I found that scientists divide up into two categories of zealots about this field. The first half are people who are absolutely entranced by the physics of these things. This quote is from a respectable scientist, in fact, one of the founders of this field, that may, be a little bit, may look a little strange to you who don't follow theoretical physics, but there is a very clear prediction that our most successful theory of nature makes, and that is that there are an enormous number, mind-bogglingly large number, of parallel realities, as real as this one, that have different consistent histories. So imagine a world where all of the laws of physics as we know them are obeyed, but different decisions were made along the way. Different decisions at the level of tiny microscopic particles, different decisions all the way up to what you chose to eat for lunch, and whether you chose to come to this session or not. Quantum mechanics makes a very specific prediction that all of those are as real as the thing that you remember. And this is bizarre, because we don't see those other things. But science has reached the point now where we can build machines that exploit those other worlds. And quantum computers are perhaps the most exciting of all of these that we have within, or almost within our grasp right now. So people from a physics background love this. They want to understand the world. They want to understand the universe, how it all works. But science has reached the point now where we can build machines that exploit those other worlds. Exploit those other worlds. Exploit those other worlds. It gives these computers access to these new resources, maybe you could call them parallel universes, in order to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. And that's not the only one. In fact, the one I'm going to com come back to and talk to in the context of the story that I'm wrapping this in was recently installed at NASA. And Google uh, was the primary uh, interested party that pulled this whole thing together. And this one is really exciting to me. Because what they're going to do is apply this machine to an area that I think is fundamentally important. It's the crux of our future as humans. And that's, can we build machines like us? So building machines like us might be possible. I certainly believe it is. I might be wrong. But what I do know is that the types of approaches that people are taking now to build intelligent machines benefit immensely from what this machine that we've built does best. They're doing something completely different than what your computer does. And that thing is like flight. It gives these computers access to these new resources, maybe you could call them parallel universes, in order to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. It gives these computers access to these new resources, maybe you could call them parallel universes, in order to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. From the outside, they look like giant black monoliths, big metal boxes, about 10 feet on a side, 12 feet tall. And they are powered, they have a fridge inside them, a refrigerator that cools these chips to almost absolute zero. Just a wisp, a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. Hundreds of times colder than interstellar space. Amongst the coldest and most isolated and extreme conditions that humans have ever been able to engineer. These fridges, interestingly enough, which are called pulse tube dilution refrigerators, have a thing called a pulse tube, which emits a sound roughly once per second, which sounds eerily like a heartbeat. So if you're sta you have the opportunity to stand next to one of these machines, it is an awe-inspiring thing, at least for me. It feels like an altar to an alien god. It, they really are impressive machines. At the heart of this big box is a tiny chip about the size of your thumbnail. And on this chip resides all of the wonder and magic that makes this thing go. 
I'm not going to describe in any mathematical detail how it all works, but let me give you an analogy. In quantum mechanics, there's this concept that an, a, a, a thing can exist in two states which are mutually exclusive at the same time, quote unquote. So I'm using those words because the English language was developed before we had concepts to describe what these things actually are doing. But I'm gonna give you a, a, a roundabout way of understanding this. Imagine that there really are parallel universes out there, and now imagine you have two that are exactly identical in every respect, all the way out to the horizon as far as we can see, down to the last little atomic detail of every single thing with only one difference. And that's the value of a little thing called a qubit on this chip, which is a contraction of quantum bit. And that qubit is very much like a bit or a transistor in a conventional computer. It has two distinct physical states, which we call zero and one for bit. In a conventional computer, these are mutually exclusive. That device is either one or the other, and never anything else. In a quantum computer, that device can be in this strange situation where these two parallel universes have a nexus, a point in space where they overlap. And when you increase the number of these devices, you, every time you add one of these qubits, you double the number of these parallel universes that you have access to until such time when you get to a chip like this, which is about 500 of these bits, you have something like two to the 500th power of these guys living in that chip. So the way I think about it is that the shadows of these parallel worlds overlap with ours. And if we're smart enough, we can dive into them and grab their resources and pull them back into ours to make an effect in our world. Now this may sound very odd to you and bizarre, and in fact I am using language that a normal theoretical physicist probably wouldn't use, but this is, what I'm telling you is absolutely correct and in line with the way that these things actually work. We've been doing this for some time now, and in fact we have our own version of Moore's Law. The doubling uh, of the number of these qubits on the chip has happened once a year for the past nine years. So for the last nine years, every year, the number of these qubit devices has doubled and it will continue to do so. As a point of reference in terms of how fast these things are, in one generation of chip, the one from the, the system that was installed at USC to the one that Google and NASA have now, the speed of the device went up by almost a half a million. This is the kind of progress that you're going to see with these types of machines going forward. And half a million sounds like an abstract number, but I put up a, a little mental comparison here to see what 5,000 really means. 5, 000, 500,000 is a big number when it comes to speed. It feels like an altar to an alien god. It, they really are impressive machines. It feels like an altar to an alien god.